So welcome back to the second lecture on weak convergence. So let me start with a quick recap of what we did last time. So we introduced this weak notion of convergence called weak convergence, which tells us that a sequence xn in any norm space, we define that converges weakly to an element x in the norm space if applying any linear functional on it, any bounded linear functional on, on it, it looks like the, the sequence converges. So therefore we want f of xn goes to f of x. So this is weak convergence is different than norm convergence, but historically it was not the case that, oh, everyone needs to care about strong convergence first and most of all, and weak convergence is just a side hustle, so to say. But actually when people invented functional analysis, they felt both of these notions of convergence have basically equal status. And depending on what you want, they really, you have to choose one or you have to choose the other, or often you choose the weak convergence first, and then maybe later on you actually manage to turn weak convergence into strong convergence with extra arguments. Or weak convergence is all that you can get. So we've already seen that this notion of convergence has the right properties for something which should be a nice convergence. So we have weak limits being unique. We have seen that weakly convergent sequences are still bounded. And we have seen that while there's not a continuity in behavior of the norm with respect to weak convergence, there's an inequality. So that's what's called a semi-continuity, that if I have an x which is obtained as a limit, then the corresponding norm of x is less than or equal to the limb sup as the corresponding thing of the sequence. So that's what, that's what would be called weak lower semi-continuity of the norm, if you want, like really long words. For us, this is just enough. And that is equivalent, sort of geometrically, with saying that the closed balls with given radius around zero, they are closed under weak convergence. So if all of the accents are in here, then also the limit is going to be in here. And so what we're going to do today is see that these properties of being closed under weak convergence is a more general property depending on the geometry of your set. Namely, if you have convexity, everything is good. We're also going to talk about weak convergence in Banach spaces where things are just easier as usual. And then we are also going to hopefully talk about weak compactness, weak sequential compactness, because that's really the reason we want that weak convergence for now. So a quick just comment here, this is all at the level of sequences, and that's all we do in this course, sequential stuff. You can put everything also in the sort of language of topology and talk about weakly open sets, weakly closed sets, you can talk about weak compactness in the sense of open cover definition of compactness and all of that. But you have to be really careful because you know that some things are equivalent when you're a metric space, but things are no longer equivalent if you're not a metric space. And that's an instance where things can go pretty badly wrong. And actually the whole business with weak topology is quite a lot more abstract and involved. So some of you will really enjoy that. And if you do enjoy that, you can just wait until next year. That's covered quite extensively in the course Further Functional Analysis. For more the user-friendly version is with sequences here. And that's what you need a lot in life if you do anything to do with variational theory, PDEs, anything to do with minimization. OK, so let's get started. And then let's start with generalizing this. And the generalization of this is the theorem of Mazur. So theorem. 4.4 is telling us that if we have a set which is convex and closed, then it's closed under weak convergence. So let's, as usual, x just the norm space. So in this chapter, x being Banach is less important. We need it a bit later on, but there's quite a few things which are valid for just norm spaces. And we want k to be in x closed, as in the standard closed and convex. Then k is closed under weak convergence. I.e., if we know xn is a sequence, 
so that xn is in k, xn converges weakly to x, then this implies that also x is in k. Well, let's maybe call it x infinity. Quick warning just to confuse everyone. So you could call this weakly sequentially closed. Careful, weakly closed is stronger than strongly closed, which sounds really weird at first. But the reason for that is weak convergence is a weaker assumption than strong convergence. So what strong closeness means, or so regular closeness means a strong assumption gives you x is in k. Weak closed, or here sequentially weak closed, means a weak assumption implies x is x infinity is in k and therefore this is a stronger statement. So any set which is weakly closed will be strongly closed because any sequence that has satisfies the strong assumption of converging strongly will satisfy the weaker assumption of converging weakly and hence it gives you this property if you have weak, um, weak closeness. So that's sort of this, this weird thing. Whenever you weaken something, then the conclusions become stronger if they still hold. So that property is strong. Therefore, in particular, without this closed here, just forget about the statement. It's completely wrong. It cannot be true. On the other hand, there's loads of sets which are closed but not convex, which are weakly closed. Simplest example of a convex, non-convex set which is weakly closed. Simplest examples of stuff which is closed is always start with a singleton. A singleton is still convex. Two singletons are not convex. But that definitely works. Okay, so let's prove this. And to prove this, we need, so last time we used basically Han Banach for everything. So this time we do something different and we use a geometric version of Han Banach. So there's a geometric version of Han Banach that again you will see in the fourth year course if you take that. And this geometric version is about separating sets by hyperplanes. So this is theorem. 4.5, which we are not going to prove because that's proved in the, the other course. And it's, we call it hyperplane separation theorem. And this tells us that if we have the right type of sets, then we can put a hyperplane in between them. And so when you think about this, you can actually come up with the right assumptions by yourself. So certainly if I have some kind of sets, where one of them does something funny like that. And then I put another set in here. Then I can certainly not separate them with a hyperplane. That doesn't work. If I have sets which intersect, I can definitely not separate them by hyperplanes. So I certainly need convexity and I certainly need disjointness. And then I need a few more small things. So what I need exactly is if X is a norm space and we have two sets A, B, contained in X, they should be disjoint, they should be convex, and I want at least one of them to have a non-empty interior. So let's say B, doesn't matter which, of course. Then I can separate them. So they can be separated by a hyperplane. And hyperplanes are sets of points where functionals take a certain value. And because we want to consider both complex valued spaces and real valued spaces, we actually look at the real part of functionals. I.e. what we get is that there is some L, which is in X star, corresponding constant C in R, such that we have that A and B are separated by the hyperplane of all x, so that the real part of L of x is equal to c, 
i.e. what I want is one of them to have inequality less than c and the other greater or equal to c. So what I want is the real part, say, of L of A should be less than C, less than or equal, and it should be less than or equal to the real part of L of B. And this for every A in A and for every B in B. So here you will only be able to get less than or equal. We don't assume any compactness, we don't assume any closeness or anything like that. If you impose some extra conditions on sets being compact, you have a chance of getting strict inequalities. There's much more general versions than what we need. All we need here is we want to be able to separate the single point from the corresponding um, convex set that we have uh, in our theorem up there. So a corollary of this theorem, so corollary 4.6 is if k is closed and convex and x0 is an element which is not in k, then I can separate strictly as in there exists a nice positive number, so let's call it delta positive. There's an L in x star so that I can bound the real part of L of x from above by the real part of L of x0 minus delta, and I can do this for every x. So the picture in this situation is, in the previous situation, you can have basically sets coming really, really close to each other, so something like that. So you might need a hyperplane that really just, just about goes in between them. So that's what we need here. Now in this situation, we have one convex set, maybe it's unbounded or anything like that, and I have a point here, x0, but the important point is k is closed, and so because k is closed, I have an epsilon ball around it, which is not intersecting that, and so the way you prove this, proof by picture, I'm going to write it down in a moment, but proof by picture, you separate the epsilon ball from the set, and that epsilon ball will be at a certain distance, from a, a, the sort of the hyperplane will be at a certain different distance of x0, and that gives me the delta here. So let's just write this down as well. So proof, as said, we have x0 is in x without k, which is open. So there is an epsilon positive. Oh, and of course, I sorry, my statement is uh, nobody spotted it. This theorem, if you had to prove it, you could prove it in half a line. So this would be a typical stupid question to ask on an exam, because you can score full marks by saying, take L equals zero. That wouldn't be fun, so let me say L not equal to zero, because otherwise, yep. Not the most exciting statement. Okay. So let's go back to this. We have a point in the open set, so there's an epsilon ball around it, B epsilon of x0, which is contained in x without k. So we can separate the k and this ball using the theorem. So absolutely no problem with empty interior here. We have a ball that thing has an empty, a non-empty interior over there. So that assumption is fine. That one we don't know, but we don't care. We only need it for one thing. So we separate this and we get a exciting L, so an L not zero, so that L of the real part of L of X is less than or equal to the real part of L of x0 plus z for all z which have norm less than epsilon. And now we just say, well, if we choose a smart z here, we can just get ourselves a delta. 
So basically, I'm splitting that up and I'm choosing the right set. So I write this up as real part of L of x0 plus or minus, I guess it doesn't really matter, plus real part of L of z. And now I just need a set so that real part of L of z is negative, but we know that L is not zero. So there is some kind of y so that L of y is not zero. Whenever you have something which is not zero, you can scale it and you can rotate it with a complex number. So we can do without loss of generality, norm of y is one. And without loss of generality, L of y is in the reals and positive. Otherwise, I multiply it with a unit uh, element of C. And now I'm just needing the right set. So I want a set which is negative, giving me a negative L. So I'm going to take Z is a little bit of Y in negative direction. So I can take, for example, Z is minus epsilon half of Y. And then we get that this thing up there, real part L of Z. So this is now minus epsilon half L of y, which is delta, uh, which is positive. Uh, so this thing is positive. So I can write this as minus delta. And then I can go back and say, this is minus delta for delta positive. And as usual, we go back using the following argument. So we get this extra bit by having the whole ball. And important about this whole ball is every single direction is allowed in the ball. Therefore, there must be a direction which decreases or increases my L. And that's the thing I need. OK, so that's sort of the standard version as you're going to use. Usually, the theorem of Mazur, you want to say, I really am worried if I have a sequence of elements of k that my limit suddenly drops out of k. And that's very important when you do arguments like minimization and so on, where you take approximate solutions and you hope the candidate that you get is still allowed in your problem. Still allowed usually means being in the same set that you started out with. So you usually want to pose your problems in convex sets, which actually works quite well in practice. You can also think of all of this as just a much more geometric thing. And you can think of the theorem of Mazur just telling you something about convex sets in infinite dimensional spaces that you've known from before for convex sets in finite dimensional spaces. Namely, that if I have something convex, I can just think of it as taking loads of half spaces and intersecting them. So this theorem is uh, the geometric version is as follows. So Oops, let me just put that here. So theorem 4.7, this is just the geometric version of the theorem, is that every closed convex set in a norm space can be written yeah, in X can be written as intersection of half spaces. As in half spaces X, so that L of X less than or equal to C, or real part of L of X less than or equal to C, for suitable basically pairs L and C, which are in X star cross um, the reals. And suitable here really means some kind of index set. You shouldn't expect the set that you need to be countable or anything like that. In general, that's an uncountable set. And this is part of the exercise sheet as an optional, as an optional exercise. You basically take all of the LCs that are doing the right thing, that contain your set and you take a huge intersection over them. 
and then this works. And of course, once you prove that, you just say, well, every half space is just by definition, uh, it's just closed under weak convergence because half spaces have to do with functionals and actually things converge when you have weak convergence. Therefore, because the half spaces are closed under weak convergence, intersections of half spaces are still closed under weak convergence. And so you're done. Okay, so now I've been, so we've used that, but we've proven the corollary and we've uh, therefore obtained um, our result. So, or oh, we've not quite obtained our result. Sorry, oops. So we have this corollary which tells us we can separate and we should just very briefly say why this implies the theorem of Mazur. So on the one hand, you can prove it geometrically, prove that on the problem sheets and then just get this theorem for free as a corollary or alternatively, you can just get this theorem for free from the corollary as well. So prove that corollary implies theorem, so the one up here, 4.4. So basically, I want to show x is in my convex set. I want to apply a statement about points which are not in the convex set. So the only reasonable thing to do is argument by contradiction. So suppose it was false. So let's suppose that xn, they're all nice link k. xn converges weakly to x, but x is not in k. Then take the, the L and the delta from the corollary and get your contradiction. So what do we get? We get that the real part of L of x0 minus delta, that thing bounds from above the real part of L of xn for every single n because those guys are in the convex set k. Therefore, it bounds the limit. But the limit is the right hand side without the delta. So that's real part of L, L of, sorry, it's not x0, zero, zero turned in infinity, which is nearly the same, right? So x infinity. And so we have a contradiction. As delta really was positive. Okay, so we have a nice set of objects where weak convergence gets us back into the set and therefore where knowing that we have a convergent subsequence will be extremely useful. Now before we go and talk about convergent subsequences and compactness, let's talk about the special case of a Hilbert space to get a bit of a better feeling of what this weak convergence does. So in the next bit, I just want to consider Hilbert spaces. So that's our chapter 4.3. This is weak convergence in Hilbert spaces. And so we're all too lazy to continue writing x Hilbert 10 times in this chapter. So for the whole of this section, well, my assumption is let x be Hilbert. And I just leave it up to you to also think about where do I really need the completeness of the space? So we're always going to use that inner product spaces are important, but actually a few things are fine when you just have an inner product space which is not complete. So first of all, to test if a sequence converges strongly, we can use the following nice lemma. So this is 4.8, seems. So what we want to have is that xn converges strongly to x. So basically that's what you would like to have a lot in life. 
but someone might give you for free that XN converges weakly. Or maybe you would like to have a strongly convergent subsequence, and then the compactness statement we will have later gives you that the weakly convergent sequence for free. So now we want a condition so that this is implied by weak convergence plus something else which is nice to test. And something else that's nice to test is looking at the norm. So what that actually is enough if xn goes weakly to x and the norm of xn doesn't drop but it converges to the norm of x. So we've had quite a few examples where the norms dropped when you pass to the weak limit. That will not be strongly convergent. But as soon as the norms stay preserved and you have that, this still holds. And so you will prove this on your problem sheet. You will prove it for Hilbert spaces first because there it's like two lines. You will then also prove it uh, for uniformly convex spaces. So anyone who wants to have a shortcut on the problem sheet, just ignore the Hilbert space thing and prove it for uniformly convex things first because every Hilbert space is uniformly convex. You could do that. On the other hand, Hilbert spaces is easier. Uniformly convex is actually really useful in life because your favorite spaces, or at least my favorite spaces, everything to do with LP for non-evil P, as in P not 1 and not infinity, is a uniformly convex space. So that tells you if you're wondering whether a function converges strongly in LP, all you have to test is weak convergence and not dropping norm. And not dropping norm is, for example, something, you know, sometimes works quite well with various convergence theorems and things like that. Okay, so that's your job. Then let's do something where I do a bit of work. So let's go from a lemma to a useful proposition. Again, one way of checking convergence, but now checking weak convergence. So if you're in a Hilbert space, the good news is concept of a basis makes a lot of sense. It's a useful notion of basis, namely ON basis. And so we can think about whether knowing stuff to do with the ON basis is good enough to know stuff about just convergence, for example. For just strong convergence, just testing a sequence XN with an ON basis definitely doesn't give you convergence in strong norm. There's lots of counterexamples, but for weak convergence is actually enough. So let's take E yota and ON basis of X, which we know always exist. That, things, that thing might be uncountable. That's why I write yota, yota in some index set. It will only be countable if your space is separable, but so what? We take an ON basis, and then again we have an equivalence. So we get that Xn converges weakly to X, if and only if Xn tested with E yota converges to X with E yota for every yota in there, so for every basis element. Now it's tempting to stop at this point because that seems quite reasonable, right? We know an element of a Hilbert space can be written up as a sum with the ON basis with these coefficients. And if the coefficients converge, that should probably do the job. But actually that's just completely wrong. And you could get a very easy counterexample where I just take some of the E yotas and I scale them up. And if I scale things up, I have no chance for weak convergence because one of the basic things we learned last time is that weak convergence implies boundedness. So whenever you want to destroy weak convergence, first try to make it unbounded. Then you have a counterexample. So we definitely need to include this. And actually, that's the assumption I need is Xn bounded. Together, these two do the job. So let's prove this. So we have an equivalence, which means we have a cheap way and a more expensive way, usually. Cheap way is this direction. So this is OK. The reason it's OK is what we just said. Weak convergence gives boundedness. 
and it's also because the map set maps to set iota, this is certainly an element, so if I call this t, is in x star. Indeed, everything that is in x star is of the form like this with some kind of right hand side. That's Ries representation theorem, and that's going to be the basis of the other direction because we somehow need to come from elements of the dual space to testing with guys. So the other direction needs to start with let L be in X star, and the only chance of continuing is Ries representation theorem. So by Ries, we know there is some kind of Y in X such that L of x, or let's say L of z, is equal to z y for all z in x. And now comes the usual, for a few y's, it's very easy to check that the corresponding l's converge. For which y's? Well, if y is one of the ei's, I'm going to be fine, just by definition. If I have a few of the iotas together with a few coefficients, life is good. So on the span, it will be fine. If I'm not in the span, but if I'm in the closure of the span, should probably work by density. And then the good news is the ON basis, and ON basis is so that the span is dense, hence the closure of the span is everything. So let's do this. So basically as the span of the iotas, So as these guys in x is dense, I get that for every epsilon positive, there exists a y twiddle in the span of this set, iota, such that the norm of y minus y twiddle is less than epsilon. And now I do my usual trick to show something goes to zero. I show the limb soup is less than any epsilon to get it down. So hence, we get that L of xn minus L of x. And I want limb soup of this. So that's the same as limb soup of inner product xn minus x multiplied with y. And I'm just putting in a plus y twiddle minus y twiddle to make my life easier. And now I'm splitting with a triangle and I'm saying the y twiddle is the really the harmless one because that lives in the span and that's where things will be fine. And the other one is the small one, so that's going to be fine. So I can bound this with lim soup of, let me first take the y twiddle, so xn minus x, y twiddle. And then the other I just Cauchy Schwarz. So I can just take the lim soup norm xn minus x times y minus y. And so that thing is less than epsilon. And now this thing, I can even get rid of the lim soup and just take the supremum over the whole thing. Here it's important that the xn's are bounded. Otherwise that bit fails if that supremum can be infinite. I can't do anything, but that's less than the soup over the norm xn plus the norm of x. So this is this bit here. And this thing here, this is equal to zero because each of the individual ones, each of the individual iota is actually having xn minus x goes to zero. So this is s xn minus x iota goes to zero for every iota, and remember span is the set of finite linear combinations. So this is just by the usual AOL. So therefore we have zero, we have a bit of epsilon, so this is less than some constant times epsilon, and this holds for all epsilon. So we're done. So this gives us that if we are 
in a Hilbert space. For weak convergence, we test with an OM basis. For strong convergence, we additionally look at the norms, and that way we can really decide what kind of convergence we have. So just a very, very basic application to link this back to the uh, earlier bits. Application is sequence Fn converges weakly to F in L2 from minus pi pi if and only if the Fourier coefficients converge. So all the a n of, or I should not have n, a j of f n converge to a j of f, and this for every j in z. Of course, as usual, this is definitely not enough for strong convergence. We would need a whole lot more for that. You would need really a decay rate of those things and yeah, just forget it. Okay, so that's Hilbert spaces, and Hilbert spaces are nice. We have this theorem, we can also draw a small corollary out of that. If you ever in your life need a weakly convergent sequence that doesn't have convergence in norm, and you want it in a general Banach space, the thing to go for is just a sequence which has only one one when you test it with the ON basis and nothing else. So if you take an ON sequence itself, that converges weakly to zero, but not strongly. So quick corollary of all of this pen is that every ON sequence converges weakly but not strongly. To zero. And the proof of this is just extend to an OM basis. And apply the theorem. So we know that we can always extend. You can, for example, take the corresponding space, take the orthogonal complement of the thing, which is again the Hilbert space, and you've proven that every Hilbert space has an ON basis. Therefore, you can extend any ON set to an ON basis. OK, so that's Hilbert spaces. And that's a good warm up for what we're doing now which is weak compactness, because weak sequential compactness, we're going to bluff it for loads of spaces, and we're going to prove it for Hilbert spaces. Because the proof for general reflexive spaces is quite a lot more difficult than what is covered in this, in this course. But it's, you know, we just need to know it's true, and we need to get a bit of an impression of where this comes from. So let's talk compactness. So that's the last sort of theoretical part of the lecture, which, uh, well, not of the full lecture, but on, of the chapter. And after that, we'll then be able to do applications of this weak compactness. And so this is weak sequential compactness. So first, a nice definition of just saying what we talk about. So just counting where definition 11. Something is weak sequentially compact if everything, every sequence has a convergent subsequence in the sense of convergence that we consider at the moment. So here in the sense of weak convergence. So A contained X is called weak sequentially compact if for all sequences a n with yeah a n in a for all n there exists a convergent subsequence so there exists a subsequence a n j and there's a, a which is in a so that a n j goes weakly 
So as usual, anything to do with compact needs the corresponding closeness statement because I'm, I'm still going to need that the A is in there, or at least that because I have uniqueness of limits, so otherwise that would fail. I could just take a convergent sequence. If the limit is in not there, then I would have a problem. But it's much, much stronger because it's really, it gives me, I get my hands on something that converges in some kind of way. And that means I get some kind of limit object, which might be absolutely awful to start with. But once you have an object, you can start analyzing it and hope it's much, much better than what you were ever hoping for. And now having a definition, here comes the big theorem. So most important theorem of the chapter. And this is that the closed unit ball Um, of any reflexive, that's the important one here, Banach space or norm space, reflexive spaces are always Banach anyway, so, but let's just say Banach spaces. So the closed unit ball of any reflexive Banach space is um, weakly sequentially compact. Of course, if I don't have the closed unit ball, but I have closed ball of any radius, that's still true. Just rescale. If I move my ball to another place, then zero, that's still true. So everything is good. And so the important part of this is therefore corollary 13, that if xn is a bounded sequence in a reflexive Banach space, or reflexive norm space, then it has a convergent subsequence. And so Reflexive, remember, reflexive has to do with the dual space of the dual space of a space being the same in the sense that the canonical injection that we've used last time is a surjective map. So it's always isometric, but in general, it's not surjective. And what that has to do with compactness seems pretty unclear. So why should that give compactness? It's even more unclear of that this is actually the same. And that's something I found really weird when I first read it of why should, okay, I can get it that nice spaces have nice extra properties, but why should sequential compactness have anything to do with the space being reflexive? So the fun part, it's true, so it's a fact, and this is certainly beyond this course, but it's true, and you hardly ever use it in that direction because normally showing something is reflexive is the easy part, showing something is it's weakly, sequentially compact is the hard part. But basically for X Banach, you're having that X reflexive is actually equivalent to the unit ball being weakly compact. So weakly, sequentially compact. Careful, weakly compact is something different because we're not in a metric space so compact cover business is not the same as compact sequence business. And then I want to, so this is a theorem of Eberlin. And then I also want to remark that there's an important analog for dual spaces. And what we are saying in dual spaces is that a sequence Fn in X star, this converges weak star. So it's very creative. It's weak and it's in X star. So we call it weak star convergence to F. If plugging in elements of X gives you convergence. So if Fn of X goes to F of X for every X in X. 
So that's weak star convergence. And now you can actually talk about compactness in the weak star topology of the unit ball. And it's a quite deep result that you can learn about in fourth year that this corresponding unit ball is cover-wise compact with respect to weak star topology. And then you can say, oh, well, what do I care about that if I want sequences? And then compactness doesn't give me sequential compactness directly, so because I'm not in a metric space, so what? Actually, what you're going to prove on the problem sheet is that for most of your favorite spaces, the unit ball is weak star compact, because most of your favorite spaces are separable. And so when you have a separable space, the dual space has this really nice property that you have weak star compactness. And you get that com bounded sequences in the dual space of a separable space will have a convergence subsequence in that sense. And that's actually a lot easier to prove because separability is fun. Separability means you get just countably many elements which sort of are relevant. If you have convergence, you need to prove some convergence and you have countably many elements. If you try anything else than a diagonal sequence argument, you're making your life too difficult because that's just a reasonable thing to do and that works really well. So let me just make this remark. I'll just continue the remark. If x is separable, then every bounded sequence in x star has a weak star convergent subsequence. And I would encourage you to just play around a little bit with these notions of weak star convergence and weak convergence, because you can also think of causes x star just as a Banach space. What does weak convergence then mean? It corresponds to applying elements of the dual norm, so the dual of the dual space, so the dual of the dual, which is the bidual. So it shouldn't surprise you that in the situation where you're reflexive, you actually have a nice connection between weak star convergence and weak convergence. So I'm going to let you explore that, but that gives you a different way of viewing things. And most of the spaces that you work with, like LP spaces, they have all of these nice properties. Again, LP for P not evil, i.e. not one or infinity, I can write LP either, think of it as a reflexive space. I can also think of LP as the dual space of LQ, where Q is again between one and infinity. So you know that LQ is a separable space. So I can think of LP as a dual space of a thing where this applies, and that gives me a nice way to do weak convergence. So that's it for today. The task for next time is of course, proving the theorem, at least proving the theorem for Hilbert spaces, and then we're going to apply it to see how this gives the direct method of calculus of variations, which is a statement which has like loads of assumptions with quite long names, but actually gives you existence of minimizers, and is quite fun to prove. So, see you all next time.